Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Brian Schweers, who is the commanding officer of the second Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company, and you will hear us refer to this as Anglico. Brian Schweers, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, John, I appreciate it. Thank you for this opportunity. Incredibly humbled to be with you today. And before we begin, I would just like to mention that Lieutenant Colonel Schweers' opinions are his own and do not necessarily represent the opinions or policies of the Marine Corps, the United States Department of Defense, or United States government. The conversation I'd like to have with you today, Brian, will cover the Marine Corps' Anglico capability and your all-domain effects team concept. But before we get into these topics, could we start by getting an, getting your assessment of our strategic landscape? This might seem cliche, but the word really is dynamic. Uh, and the reasons for the, the, the reason I use that word is look at our near peer and how they view war first off. Uh, the Western world kind of views conflict with violence, as opposed to if you look at uh, our near peers, they look at conflict across the competition continuum. Uh, also looking at the global connectivity, economically, informationally, uh, the world is just closer together. Uh, nothing happens in isolation. So when you have conflicts, second, third order effects impacts a greater population uh, than we've seen in the past. And what that creates is like a blurring of your economic, political, and almost military lines and decision-making a little bit. Uh, and what that landscape really requires for uh, military forces is an agile force that can really quickly transition across mission areas, operate in all domains, and then across the full competition continuum. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the, some of these sayings sound like they're just platitudes or lip service, but the kinds of things that Clausewitz wrote about so long ago that you know, war is a continuation of politics by other means and uh, uh, great power competition or, uh, you know, needing like a, a whole of society or a whole of government effort in order to um, address these challenges. Like, like I said, they, they sound like platitudes, but uh, you, you guys are really living this. Would you say that that's fair? I, I think that's fair. I think Clausewitz, when you look at his research, understood the true nature of warfare. When we talk about it, it's just getting more comp complicated. So his, his basic fundamental and underlying ideas still remain the same. Uh, but again, I think the character of war in itself is starting to change a little bit with the social media aspect and the economic aspect with that, again, that global connectivity, which is just unprecedented. Right. And the social media, the uh, sanctuary of the homeland that the United States, for example, has enjoyed, and perhaps even uh, countries like Australia, and I'm sure there's other examples, but the sanctuary of the homeland um, is obliterated with social media, uh, especially in an information context. Yeah, the protection of the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean uh, that has helped us in the past, uh, social media has broken those down. So it's, it's just adding additional challenges. And again, it just adds to that whole dynamic aspect of it. Um, it's just, it is reshaping, again, the politics, the economic military, and it's just, they're, they're interconnected because of it. Several months ago, Brian, we had uh, Colonel Brian Russell on the podcast, and we'll have a link in the show notes. And Brian described to MIG and its capabilities. And so you, you are one of the commands which comprises uh, to MIG, uh, second, second Anglico. And so many in our audience may not be familiar with the Marine Corps' Anglico capability. Do you think you could give us a quick 101, which will simultaneously help set the stage for the all domain effects team concept? 
I'll do my best. Uh, the mission set is, is incredibly unique. You're actually not gonna see another type of mission that we do across the Department of Defense. And I spent four years as, Anglica, as an Anglican uh, when I was a captain, and now I've, I've commanded it for two years. So I've had about six years experiences with Anglico. And I can tell you, it takes you sometimes almost two to three years just being in the unit to fully understand what we do. But really our basic mission set is we really provide a liaison capability with a fire's expertise to non-Marine Corps formations. All right, what's that mean? Uh, what we do is we take Marine capabilities and forces and we extend them to joint allies and partners. At the same time, we create interoperability. We train with the Army all the time. We train with the Navy. We train with the allies and partners. We understand our TTPs. We understand our capabilities. And then we can leverage those capabilities for Marine forces. So really, we're, we're a huge combat multiplier. Uh, a, a decent vignette to explain what we really do is uh, back in 2010, when I was with the first Anglico, we were supporting the British that were operating within the Marine Corps area of operations. The British had very limited organic uh, aviation uh, capabilities. And every time they go out, they would get into contact and they basically had no assets. Uh, so what I did was I actually requested and got about six hours worth of Marine Corps uh, aviation to come support a British operation. Uh, the Marines came down and the British covered more ground uh, in that six hours than they had covered in about two months. And so again, we were working for the British uh, within the, a Marine Corps area of operation and we extended the Marine Corps assets to the British to basically uh, provide a, a better capability for them. I, I see. And so that is, you know, really highlights the liaison uh, component of your mission. Yeah, exactly. We just, we get sent places uh, and then we, we make friends and relationships uh, and then we try to bring capabilities together to, to make the Marine Corps stronger or the joint allied partner that's operating again with the Marine Corps, or it could be adjacent to the Marine Corps and just making each other fighting forces stronger so we can defeat our adversary. And again, traditionally, Anglico and our mission set has really been kinetic wise or lethal, lethal fires wise, uh, just due to the war on terror, conducting counter terror uh, insurgency operations last 15 years. But we've realized we've got to expand our capabilities for the 21st century, uh, specifically in combined arms or recognize we can bring multiple capabilities to bear with our allies and partners going forward. Gotcha. Perhaps we can transition a little bit, Brian, into this new concept of the all domain effects team. Um, why is Anglico chosen to take the lead on this new initiative? Great question, and that's a question I get asked all the time. Uh, I think that really the first answer is just the natural evolution. Look at Anglico. It, the first one is air naval gunfire. If you look at World War II and amphibious operations, Anglico was specifically stood up to integrate uh, air with naval gunfire. So really it took two domains, your air domain and your maritime domain and brought them together. So technically Anglico has been doing multi-domain operations since probably the, the 40s. Uh, with the advent of the two operational domains of cyber and space, it just makes natural sense to expand those capabilities to the other domains that Anglico can do. Second reason is our expertise as fire supporters. We live in the realm of effects, specifically achieving combined arms. Uh, we understand the effects the commander wants to achieve, what the capabilities are required to achieve them, and how we actually plan, coordinate, integrate those to achieve effects are just some of the best in the Marine Corps. Uh, we shape a battle space, we set conditions for success, and then we converge effects on a decisive place and time for the ultimate results. Uh, the third reason is we just breed a culture of integrators. Like we talked about our mission, we send Anglicans out there to make relationships link capabilities together, uh, and we are just integrators. We de-stove pipe capabilities. We like working with each other and other people, uh, and we just try to maximize our effects as possible. It's a, it's a cultural mindset that we bring that I think really can drive this, this future development. Hmm. Yeah, that really makes a lot of sense that you, you guys have integration as part of your historical mission, and so it's, it's in Anglico's DNA to play an integrator role and so this is just continuing that heritage, I guess, uh, into this new concept. Uh, but also, yeah, back to your points about uh, liaison with other forces, allies, et cetera. 
if you know, that's one of the big foot stompers that I've learned, uh, having you know done you know many interviews with a whole bunch of different stakeholders uh, in the information environment that. Um, uh, relationships with partners and outli- allies, but but also relationships across uh, governmental agencies are more important today than than ever before. It's it, it's not like they've they've always been unimportant, but I think that there's just a special emphasis being put now on this kind of relationship building and liaison uh, capability, which it sounds like you guys have been living for many decades now. We have, and to your point, we go back to that dynamic aspect of the whole government approach to to deal with these dynamic situations across the competition continuum is just, it's it's incredible. And to your point, uh, do we work well with the Department of State? Uh, We have in the past, not as much. We are still primarily military, but to your point, can that be expanded future-wise? Again, that's potentially future-wise, but right now we're not really looking into that. So can we step into the all domain effects team just a little bit more and talk about, you know, how, how are the teams uh, structured? Well, before, before we get into that, I'd like to kind of just get in the definition of what is, what is an all domain effect team? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Really what it is, is if you look at Angco's obviously resides in the information group, where if you look at the information group, it deals with operations in, in, in the uh, informational environment. And then you have this outlier, which is Angleco, which is very, Lethal, lethal fires, uh, destroying break stuff. So all this concept really is doing is taking your OIE capabilities within the MIG, combining it with some lethal fires to achieve effects across the competition continuum and putting small teams out there trying to put them at the forward edge of the battle space in support of the joint allies and, and partners forces. That's really what we're trying to do here. And the, the big thing is to understand is it's, a, it's an experiment right now. Uh, we basically have come up with an idea of what we think the future operating force should fight like, and we're trying to validate that 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 that, that concept right now. So it's still it's still pretty early in that sense. Right. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you about that. So so on the spectrum of something being fully operationalized and even considered like Marine Corps doctrine, or th- this is how the Marine Corps fights. From that end of the spectrum all the way over to the the prototype experimental end of the spectrum it sounds like the marine corps is all the way on that experimental side with this capability is that is that about right the, you are you are correct this is an experiment again we've been we, we transitioned to the all domain effects team uh organically within angleco to support it last september so this this thing is so new uh we've thrown a couple of operations at uh, at it it's just so new right now. We're still experimenting, and we're we're basically throwing spaghetti in the wall to see what actually sticks right now. Can you talk about how the teams are composed? Yeah, so the team the team's really composed. The team is led first off by an information warfare coordinator. Uh, it doesn't have to be an Anglican. I strongly recommend an Anglican only because of the, again the fire support aspect and understanding effects and how to achieve effects. And then again, just that integration mindset of relationships in that integration, it's just a culture really hard to build. It takes a very mature, uh, I would say officers to do that. And one thing Anglico does have is we have a bunch of mature captain officers that are capable of doing that. And really their job as the coordinator is just to sync all those capabilities together uh, to achieve those effects. Uh, Underneath, the, the coordinator, really, the ADET's broken down into, into five uh, unique teams. The first team is going to be your informed and influence team, which is comprised of your uh, communication strategy and your psychological operation Marines. People would be like, whoa, pause. How can you have those two working together? Um, even though, you know, obviously, Comstrat is more focused on the truth and informing the, the populace and adversaries and the psychological operations is again, trying to influence the enemy. Uh, they both deal with human beings, uh, the cognitive side and the cognitive realm of warfare. And so to have those two working together, I think has, has been really well. Uh, and we've done a pretty good job actually bringing that capability forward. Uh, we specifically have PSYOPs used to be attached or the company used to be part of the MIG, and now they're actually organic to 2nd Angleco. They moved over in, uh, in February. 
And then we started developing, uh, we have some organic comp shot capability. And so they're actually starting to work pretty well together, um, decreasing our release, our release change, trying to get that narrative out. And then how does the narrative that our comp shot informers actually being used by our stoppers against our adversaries. So that team is, is pretty well formed and we've done a pretty good job with that team. The second team is gonna be your lethal effects team, which is just your traditional Anglicans. And again, their job is really lethal fires wise. Uh, again, it's to plan, coordinate, request, and terminally control aircraft, artillery, naval gunfire, uh, high mobility, uh, rocket artillery, anything that, that can destroy stuff that Anglicans can control. And again, it's usually a four man team to almost a 10 man team, but it, their, their primary job is you need something destroyed or a, a physical effects, that team is really designed for do that. And we're, we're, we're really good at that. And that's kind of our bread and butter. The third team is going to be your exploit attack network team. And that's second radio battalion really augments that team. And they bring a pretty good capability, uh, at least a tactical level electronic warfare, specifically electronic surveillance and electronic attack. Uh, and we've done a pretty good job with them and it's just integrating them into the targeting cycle. The big thing with them is, you know, finding out electronic attack, electronic, you know, electronic surveillance, and then finding a target, handing that off to UAS, and then actually doing physical fires on that target. It's actually nothing new. We've been doing that for 15 years, but I would say it's different because normally Radbin and the lethal effects wouldn't be attached that close together. So we're actually working closer together and our basically kill change are just being drastically reduced when it comes to the basic timelines. So that's a good thing as we explore a little bit. The fourth team is your informational awareness team. And this one is, we are, this is, this is nascent. We, we are still trying to figure this one out. Uh, I think we're struggling with one, this one the most is because I think there's just an overall lack of doctrine and taxonomy in the informational world to understand what does informational awareness mean. Uh, we've reached out for products. We've reached out to people what this actually means. And to be frank, everyone's kind of doing that a little bit differently. Uh, we've, we've explored basically using some second intelligence battalion Marines, specifically open source intelligence Marines uh, to, to gather that. Uh, we've had some success, but that's still pretty uh, nascent. We're really, we're, we're, we're still trying to figure that one out a little bit. And the last team is gonna be your third command and control team. It's really driven by your eighth communications battalion. Uh, normally they support meth level, big COCs that are gigantic uh, CPs that take like seven days to move. Uh, they've almost reformed a little bit to create some expeditionary communication teams which are now almost four-man teams, which are designed to come augment the ADETs and to set up digital services. Specifically, you know, Anglicon in the past has relied specifically on just radio communications, but now diving into the informational cognitive realm, we really need to get onto computers and onto data and like heavy data. And ACOM kind of brings that capability towards us. And so we actually, our ability to send teams out and get up communications up is, is pretty strong. We've actually made pretty good progress in that. The Assurance Command and Control Team too does bring a little bit of defensive cyber capabilities too uh, with that. Uh, and so really those are your five teams and kind of where those teams are in relation to how the progression we've made on them. Mm. So when, when you deploy a team, do you, do you pick from like all those five different teams to, to, to have like a, a, uh, a small unit capable, like, oh, okay, so like, for example, to, to our audience uh, who may not be familiar with the Marine Corps Marine Expeditionary Unit uh, concept, uh, you know, MUSE are formed and uh, are uh, staffed with uh, all the capabilities of the Marine Air Ground Task Force. Would, would Anglico, for example, send a uh, all domain effects team to be embedded with a MU, but the team would be a much smaller version of uh, with with just like a couple of people from each of those sub teams that you were just describing. A great question. That's just, you know me and Colonel Russell were just talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Of what is the future for supporting the MU, and is that going to be ADA uh, ADA like? Um, 
And I think going forward, that's that's the that's where we need to go right now. It, again, this is so early right now. Uh, the MUs aren't totally uh, aware of this capability. Uh, the, the last MU, uh, I think 24th MU, we actually sent out a MIG detachment. Uh, in the past, we just sent MIG stovepipe capabilities to the MU, and the MU just kind of put them in their command element and kind of de-stove capabilities. On the 24th MU, we actually sent over it, the MIG detachment as a detachment. And so it was a much higher level uh, detachment that worked at the, the command element where your ADET is probably a little bit lower at the tactical level supporting the BLT ashore, if that makes sense, where you can bring those again, the ADET really designed to get more to the forward edge of the battle space. But to your point, feature-wise, that's something we'd like to get to. And to really answer your question is how we kind of been employing these is lately it's, because exercises aren't exercises and operations aren't necessarily have information operations built into them. We kind of have the task organized based off the mission set right now. Uh, we kind of look at the exercise, we look at the operation, and we can try to look at hey, what effects can we actually achieve, and then we try to task organize the team based off those effects that we are trying to achieve in that sense. I see. I see. Um, also, the, the Marine Corps just recently. Um, rolled out its new information maneuver OCK field, right? I think it's 1700. Is that right? They did. And uh, so how, how is that OCK field uh, represented in the all domain effects team? Like or now, and like, I don't know, if, if you were to like scan forward five years from now, would it look any different? I think, again, the, the, if you look at the sign the sign Psychological Operation Marines are a lot of your 17s. They're already, again, we just got them into ANCO a couple months ago. And I think they're there to stay in that sense. Uh, going forward wise, we've got to figure out, I think the balance is going to be what organic capability resides in ANCO to form those ADETs. But yet, what, uh, where do they actually, do they actually fully reside in ANCO? Because the, the issue with ANCO is, I need ADETs, but I might not be able to make a comp shredder a better comp shred marine. I might not make a psychological operator better psychological operator. What Angleco can do is bring those capabilities together to bear the effects. And so that is a really difficult question going forward that I think is going to take some experimentation to figure out what organically do we hold on to Angleco to achieve the ADET? And then what uh, MOSs or you know, what's non-organic that stays within the MIG that gets tasks organized and fossed out to Angle Code to support operations, if that makes sense. Why is 2MIG doing this? Why, why are the all domain effects team something that you're experimenting with and how, how do you think it will uh, contribute to today's fight and future fights? I think the big thing is the future, it's just not enough to destroy. Uh, I think it's been plainly obvious, uh, especially in the last, especially when we look at the Ukraine and Russian war of just how Ukraine has used the narrative to gain that international support. Uh, is incredible. Mobilizing public opinion and galvanizing the will, uh, realizing that narrative is power. Uh, the globalization of digital technologies, which created the new social and political forms. I think the information and the cyber operations become very central political contest. And I think the ADAS is that natural evolution against that dynamic scenario that we talked about. Um, the old the old way the Marine Corps just wants to go in there and break things, is, it's, just, it's, it's not going to work in the future. Uh, it's not. Uh, I think also number two is just the continued relevance of combined arms. Uh, the converging effect to bear a decisive place in time uh, is going to likely make the enemy system collapse. Combined arms, if you look at you know maneuver warfare, is a doctrinal underpinning of it. And maneuver warfare, if you look at the great BIP MCPP one, that is, you know, that's going to survive the the, the the changing of warfare. Um, in that sense, and the combined arms is just getting more complicated, uh, and the all domain effects teams is the answer to that complication of the combined arms. Specifically, uh, if you look at the great article on War on the Rocks, the changing character of combined arms, it was by Jensen and, Str and Strohmeyer. Uh, they went and talked about mosaic kill webs. Uh, we're talking about the natural evolution of combined arms, where now kill webs, future wise, are going to be multi domain multi-service kill chains, very, very complicated. Uh, and the problem with that creates is 
the complexity of a battle space geometry. You're looking at trans-regional cross-combatant commands. It's going to get super complicated. And again, you have to have individuals that can work in multi-domains, that can work with multi-services, bring those all together to fill these kill chains to achieve those effects. It is the all-domain effects team. And that's that's what that's what's designed to do. And again, just looking at the future fight and what's going to be required of it, the ADA is, is, is we think is is the solution for that. Mm, yeah, that's cool stuff. And uh, we'll have a link, by the way, to that article in the show notes. What do you think they mean by kill webs? Kill webs, it's not a kill chain. Because you look at kill chain, you kind of almost see it's like it's very linear. You know, I mean you start mm-hmm. so but if you look at a piece of paper, it starts on the left hand side and it goes to the right hand side. When you look at kill webs, think of it as a spider web where there's going to be so many different interconnectedness to this. When we talk about cyber, when we talk about space, it's not going to be a nice even line. Uh, there's been a couple, when we try to look at the all domain effect teams and we try to create some vignettes and we try to create these kill chains, we realize we can't do kill chains. They're so complicated. We started creating these little line charts and it, look, it turns into a huge spider web and it gets really complicated. And I think that's where they're looking at the mosaic kill webs. It's just the complexity is just, it, it's, it's early and I don't think people realize how complex it really is. And, and I don't even know if we're even, if the joint force is even possible to do it because it is so complicated. What do you think about the uh, word kill in kill webs? I mean, do, in, in this context, does, does kill actually mean to destroy or, or to, to kill something or is it more subtle than that? The community is still so involved in physical effects. And that is just a, a perfect point is it shouldn't be kill webs because do we have to kill to achieve effects? How do we inform? How do we influence it? How do we how do we change people's decisions? We don't have to kill them, but can we actually alter their decision? Can we actually slow them down to make decisions? I think to your point, it's great. It shouldn't be kill web. Now, what should it be? I, I don't have the answer for that, but I think to your point, the kill web in itself almost almost contains it and almost almost I think doesn't give it enough aperture it deserves. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a little reading lately on uh high frequency trading, like financial trading, but these <clears throat> algorithms and, uh, you know, high speed computers, which identify arbitrage opportunities in the marketplace. But it, anyway, there's, there's these fleeting opportunities to uh, make a bet or to make a, to make a trade or, or to make millions of them <laughs> uh, and, you know, make, just a little bit of money, just a little bit of margin. But if you do it millions of times, uh, then that really adds up. And I, I think that our military community uh, or may, even uh, nation states could take a page from the high frequency trading playbook and figure out or try, I mean, lots of hand waving here, right? This is all easier said than done. But uh, to, to your earlier point, I think it was your, your team. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I forget you listed five teams, but one of them was the, um, the uh, uh, information advantage team. I think maybe, uh, uh, the, uh, I think you were talking about situational awareness, but yeah, ha- yeah. having that kind of like immediate situational awareness where, you can capitalize very quickly on, you know, and take some very small action, which to our previous point just a moment ago, doesn't kill the adversary, but just makes it just a little bit harder for them to operate. And if you do that dozens of times, then over the, you know, short to medium to long run, you really wind up making, making some gains. Um, Sorry to go on a little long there, but what what do you think about all that kind of a thought space? John, I think it's a great point. But the, the, the biggest issue, though, is you talk about, we, we go back to the word dynamic. Now you're talking about potential economic uh, impacts uh, on people, which traditionally the military doesn't necessarily, you know, in the, if you look at the national elements of power, right? Diplomacy, information, military, economics. Again, you look at democracy, those are really stovepiped. We go back to that whole government approach. Back to your point, I don't disagree where, you know, we could have that economic impact, but how do you actually have the military start diving into the economic, you know, or 
diplomatic or informational? How do we as a country, as a department of defense, get the whole government approach? And how do we actually get the whole dime on board, to your point, to try to achieve those effects, which are potentially more non-lethal, but can actually have a greater impact? That is, a, I think, a great idea. Uh, I'm just not sure how, how to actually go about getting there. And it's, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a long stride. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I, I, I think it could also scale all the way down to the tactical level. Your Marines ingesting information, you mentioned you have like an open source intelligence team, but you're constantly consuming information from various different uh, sources of intelligence and battlefield uh, observations and, you know, quickly orienting on that information in, in order to provide uh, decision-making insights back up to whomever the operational commander is so that they can make better, faster uh, decisions. I, I think it's, it's just, as a, just as applicable on the battlefield um, as, you know, at the geopolitical scale. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and you, you remind me of something too, which I forgot, which a part of the informational awareness team would actually be civil affairs injected mm. into that. Mm. And right now we don't have any civil affairs because they kind of reside in the reserves. But that's one piece I think that we're missing, which I think is you talk about the economic and you talk about the informational awareness civil affairs can be because they have interaction with the populace daily, I think is a huge advantage. And I think it's a huge opportunity that I don't think the Marine Corps uh, is set up to, 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 to capitalize on that, to your point, going to the, looking at the, the economic aspects. Mm, right. Uh, do you have any examples of the all domain effects team in action yet? Yeah, we, again, we, we threw some spaghetti on the wall, but we, we do have some successes. Uh, the first success is we deployed an ADAT, I think that was about a year ago, the British built a brand new aircraft carrier and it had its main voyage, a basic global voyage through the Mediterranean, all the way to the South China Sea, almost showing a little bit of force projection. Uh, we sent a, basically an ADET there, an ADET really comprised of uh, an Anglican that was the coordinator, and we sent an informed team with a communication strategy, and we sent a PSYOP team. And what we did was we provided so a running informational environment, running estimate for the British. Uh, we built potential adversary narratives, and then how to actually counter the narratives. And then we also did some social media analytics and metrics for not only the British Army, but also the, the Royal Navy. Uh, and not only did we do that, we actually coordinated with 1st MIG and 3rd MIG to support them all the way across their voyage. So it was almost an OIE uh, overwatch uh, across for the, for the allies. Uh, and again, it, all it was was establishing a liaison, linking up capabilities, and we linked up a bunch of Marines and we provided them a ton of information. Uh, and there, a lot of great results came out of that one. So that one was, that one was a huge success. Um, the last one is Defender Europe. We just, uh, about a month ago, we sent a team out to Estonia, uh, Lithuania, and Latvia. Uh, and they went out there to support an Army National Guard Artillery Brigade that was being supported by Air Force Air. All right, so now we've got, we've got partner countries that gave us access, working with an Army unit being supported by Air Force Air. We also brought along with us Mar uh, we brought along with us Fourth Anglico, which is actually a reserve Anglico. So we brought Marine Forces Reserve out to uh, this this uh, this operation. What was interesting about Defender Europe is uh, just to adjacent to the uh, the exercise, we had an Anglico team working with Sixth Fleet, and they're basically testing now. Uh, ground radar and ability to locate ships with ground radar. And uh, basically we had a, a, the two Anglicans kind of talk to each other and we basically set up a little bit of a mosaic kill chain is the Anglican working for six fleet actually identified a Navy ship with their radar system, contacted the Anglican that was with the army, which then coordinated uh, Air Force aviation that ended up flying over to the uh, six fleet Marine actually engaged an adversary ship uh, approved by the Navy uh, and then uh, notionally sunk it. Uh, so you're looking at 
multiple joints, uh, multiple geometries. And it was done by, it literally was done by two Anglicans at, at the company level, just two captains. Mm. Uh, so just a great example of using our partners for access, leveraging the Navy, the Army, the Air Force. Uh, it was it's just, it was an incredible feat. Wow. Now that, that, that's a mosaic kill web right there, sinking the enemy ship, right? It was, yeah. And again, it, it, sinking that enemy ship is going to, again, detract them from and limit them uh, ability to use sea lines of communication, which is, which is going to be, you know, huge, especially, and it supports the standing forces that the Commandant is trying to pursue too. And, and, and last but not least is we've been doing some backyard experimentation. And the best, I think, example for that is when you look at our natural, our normal targeting sequence, it's find, fix, track, target, engage. And that's the normal targeting cycle. What we did there is we added an informed piece of that, which is normally not done. Uh, and I've never seen it. Uh, and so and just an example is we found a target by using directional finding uh, electronic surveillance. All right. And then what we did is we queued a small UAS. We launched a small UAS to track the target. And once the UAS tracked the target, we actually engaged it uh, with, some, with some aircraft. What was unique about it is with the UAS is we took pictures before the strike and after the strike. And what was really unique is the target itself were some tanks that were basically really close to some urban environment that were kind of using the urban environment for cover. Um, and we basically struck the tanks using some precision guided munitions. We filmed all of that and then we actually landed and then we actually posted the pictures on social media. And that the really the interesting aspect of it is from the strike to actual post on social media took only 37 minutes. And so, yeah, now we can actually have a narrative of like, hey, you can't hide from us. We've got precision munitions. And then actually, and now we can actually show that and post it onto uh, media platforms. I think that's the narrative and that's the will and that's the power that I think we need to start tapping into. And I think that's what the ADAT's really potential is there for that. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, just going back to my active duty days and I, we had a conversation with um, uh, a gentleman named Todd Huntley a couple of months ago. He's retired Navy JAG and he spent a significant amount of time in uh, SOCOM, as I recall, uh, you know, as as uh, as the JAG. But anyway, get, getting those kinds of uh, approvals to do something on social media have historically been uh, rather excruciating or, you know, lots of red tape and it takes, it takes a long time to, to push something out. But it sounds like you guys are experimenting with really compressing that, uh, that decision cycle on, on getting things out into the public, public space. Is that right? I would say that that has probably been our main effort probably in the last six months is we call them, we call them release chains. How do we reduce those release chains from flash to bang? Because again, it's, it's all about the narrative and how do you get the truth at the foreign edge out into the media? So people actually understand what is going on from a, you know, uh, not only from to inform our populace, to inform international and to inform the adversary with the truth. I think it's, it is something, to your point, uh, our, our, our release chains here in, in, in CONUS, in, in continental United States, when we're just doing backyard stuff, it's fast. But when we start going over to seas, over into Europe, uh, they start getting very lengthy based off the authorities for that release. And that's something we are working hard uh, to that. Uh, I, would, I would also caveat that too of ROE, rules of engagement also depend on the level of conflict. And so sometimes I get the argument of like, you know, sir, we can't do that because of current ROE and authorities. And I go, yes, in competition, usually they're restrictive, but how do we actually create environments where we're actually at conflict, which sometimes rules of engagements are, are, are lowered a little bit because normally when conflict happens, there's more strategic vital interests at play. And when that happens, uh, those authorities sometimes are, are decentralized to speed up that processes and to speed up those effects. And so I, I, the biggest challenge I've had in the Marine Corps is how do we get people out of this counterinsurgency, can't do anything because of ROE into more, hey, 
let's start thinking across the, the, the spectrum here and how do those are how do those rules and engagement authorities change based off again the, the competition continuum and it's, it's, it's that is a challenge in ourself especially in the cognitive informational realm uh, because people to your point are very risk adverse of throwing stuff out there and, and getting in trouble right right wow well this is fascinating stuff, Brian, uh, you, you and you and your Marines there are really at the uh, bleeding edge of innovation when it comes to uh, operationalizing new capabilities um, in support of national security. So um, I'm sure it's a, I'm sure it's been quite a ride <laughs> uh, for, for you and your Marines. So well, well done and, and keep up the good work. Um, lucky you, you're, you're the very first guest that I'm going to ask this, but you know, part of the agenda and the mission of the Information Professionals Association is to be a nexus for all kinds of information professionals to come together and to examine problems and study them and um, uh, you know, do, do some good in order to uh, address this cognitive and information problem that faces us. So I wanna ask you, do you have any thoughts about you know, a couple of good research projects that a, a college student, a, a master's student, or even, you know, some students at our various different uh, war colleges could uh, take a crack at that, that might be helpful for the kinds of things that you and your Marines are working on? Well, A, John, I'm honored, because I don't think I've ever been first in anything. So this is, this is, this is a first for me. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is something that I struggle with. Um, and this is, it's really hard because again, we talk, let's talk about effects and the, the research project I would throw out there is how do you actually measure effects in the cognitive realm in the informational domain? How do you actually achieve, how can you actually achieve effects? Because we talk about the cognitive domain, we're talking about human decision-making, we're talking about like basically human brain. How are you actually going to measure the effects of that? Uh, it is. It is very difficult to measure effects on a battlefield when we talk about tanks uh, in the physical realm. Measuring effects in the cognitive realm, I just, it, it's gotta be tied to somehow to decision-making. I just don't know how to go about it. And I think it'd be an incredible thesis and some research actually, how do you measure that? If you actually achieve your effects, hey, we've thrown out some inform, we've thrown out some narratives. How do we know we're actually achieving effects? This is just a bunch of likes on social media. It's gotta be deeper than that because it's, it's changing behavior. And just because people like it doesn't necessarily mean behavior has been changed uh, in that sense. I think that's, that's, the, that's the big one I've struggled with. And I, I, don't, I don't have the answer for that. And if someone could come up with an answer for that and start steering us the right direction, I think it would be huge uh, going forward for us. All right, well, we'll, we'll put that out there as a open question to be, to be studied and uh, ultimately operationalized. Um, Okay, uh, what's a good book? What's on your nightstand uh, that's uh, either related to the kinds of things we've been talking about or, or any other good resource that uh, people interested in information operations would appreciate? This is the book, uh, and this is the book I'm gonna choose because it had a profound impact on me. Uh, I, again, I did five combat tours uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in the early 2000s and I am with Anglico. So I was the old dinosaur, physical fires, break, destroy stuff, information. I know everyone's talking about it in the Pentagon. It's, 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 the, it's the new flavor. It's the new, it's the new thing. It's the new catchphrase. Uh, but at the same time, I'm, very, I'm a very pragmatic person. And so I never saw the pragmatic aspect of the informational domain or the, the impacts of the cognitive sense. But when I read the book, uh, War in 140 Characters by David, and I'm going to butcher his name, Patrick Karakos, uh, it really woke my eyes up. Um, obviously, Singer came out with, uh, led with Life War, uh, really kind of showed social media and the impact social media is going to have uh, in the political uh, and military realm. Uh, it, gave a, it gave a couple examples, especially like the, the, the Russian bots and the impact in, in, in the election. But they're very conceptual ideas, uh, a little bit functional. Uh, war 140 characters is a little bit different where it actually gives you real world pragmatic examples of the power social media has on conflicts. Uh, and what, what I, the book is so powerful is because it, it woke me out of my old paradigm. You know, it woke me up. It's like, okay, 
We have got to get off physical fires. We have got to expand how we think about effects, uh, how we bring the information to cyberspace. Again, to your point, how do we bring the governmental approach, full governmental approach to achieve our effects? Uh, this book really, really showed it to me. Uh, specifically in the first couple chapters, uh, the first couple chapters, he talked about this really uh, Operation Protective Edge, um, where Israel is basically being rocketed, rocketed by Gaza um, and they wanted the rockets to stop. So Israel went with the good old kinetic uh, lethal fires aspect of it. Uh, and then all of a sudden you had Farah, who was a teenager in Gaza, just start doing daily tweets on what was happening. Um, the issue is Farah gained a huge international following uh, and international support, the media side, and then the political side. And what ended up happening was that international support basically uh, caused Israel to basically uh, hampered them and basically fell short of their operational and strategic objectives. So this, this teenager in Gaza basically defeated the Israeli uh, army uh, because they weren't prepared for that, the, the, the social media and the narrative in that, that, that aspect. And that, 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 that example just really woke me up where you can just Google Operation Protective Edge and you can see this little, uh, it's really interesting, this little pamphlet comes up and it, Israel is like, destroyed this many rockets, destroyed, you know, killed this many people. Uh, and it's all physical fires. And uh, they lost because of a Farah in Gaza. And she had no, uh, she's not tied politically. She just kind of just told her story on a daily basis of what was happening. And it was incredible the power that she had. One individual on a social media account uh, is incredible. Another example is the belling is the belling cat, where you had literally a single individual using open source geotagging photos that create enough evidence that confirmed that Russia shut down the Malaysian aircraft, uh, and he did it on his own. And it's funny part of the book is the CIA was wondering how the heck uh, this individual did this when the CIA has been investing million dollars trying to uncover this intelligence, and you literally had a single individual on his own initiative actually uncover that it's incident. It's just another incredible aspect of just the power of uh, social media and uh, open source. And the last one, just the Ukrainian woman. You had this woman using Facebook collecting supplies uh, from people and she'd collect these supplies and bring them forward to the Ukrainian military because uh, the Ukrainian army could not be fed or even clothed by their own government. Uh, and this woman was using Facebook to basically resupply, I think a couple of regiments. Uh, and the Ukrainian army, which is incredible. And so to me, this book needs to be read uh, by anybody uh, that has to deal with effects uh, informational wise, because it really opens up your eyes to the, the paradigm that, uh, that is coming forward. And, and keep in mind, you know, that the Israeli thing, uh, Operation Protective Edge happened in 2014. That's eight years ago. And it takes us, you know, 105 hours to release something on social media. There's no way at this point, we are, we are behind when I say of Israel learned its lessons in 2014 and has made great progress since then. But even they struggled in 2014 and we're at 2022, it's eight years. I mean, we, are, we are behind, if we don't realize that we're behind our adversaries and we're behind some of our allies and partners, I think it's just, the book is a good wake up call for all of us. Mm, well, you convinced me, Brian. <laughs> um, wow, well, what a great conversation. Um, uh, I'm really uh, serious and earnest that you you guys are, are, are doing some great work. And um, with that, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Schwears, thank you so much for being a guest on The Cognitive Crucible. I really appreciate it, John. It's great talking. I appreciate it. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.